Today, I am finishing up this sermon series in which we've entitled Hard to Love. Anybody like this series? Anybody kind of resonate with some of this series we've been talking about? Anybody had some hard to love people in your lives? Well, the first week I talked about family, didn't I? You know, how do we love those family members that make that Thanksgiving celebration and maybe that celebration of birthdays a little bit more difficult? And then last week, Pastor Nick talked about loving our enemies. And I will tell you, if you were not here, you did not hear that sermon, I encourage you to go on YouTube, our YouTube channel, or to the app, and pull his sermon up and listen to it. It was phenomenal. It was really some good teaching, and so I invite you to do that. And this week, I'm going to talk about how we are called to love in this divisive world that we find ourselves in. Anybody relate to this? This divisive world, how do we love the people who want to build barriers instead of building bridges? How do we love those we are in conflict with? As my granny would say, we butt heads with. How do we love like that? Let's, let's pray as we begin. Prayer is always a great place to start. Gracious and holy God, wash over us your spirit, your peace. <clears throat> Let us be your bridges, your instruments of peace and love in this world around us, God. Help us to see how to do that. And God, I pray that you would help me get out of the way so that your word might be proclaimed. Broken as I am, oh God, I pray that you would touch my, my mind, my voice, my tongue, your words, oh God, that they be yours. But especially, oh God, touch my heart that I too might be changed from the inside out. And I pray this in the name of Jesus and all of God's children agreed and said, amen. Well, how about those Kansas City Chiefs last week? Yeah. Woo. I'm sorry, Eagles fans in the room, I'm sorry. But man, that was a great game, wasn't it? And I fully confess I am not a football fan. I've never been one of those people that sit and watch football. I can understand the rules and stuff, but I watch the Super Bowl mainly for the commercials. Anybody here with me on that? I can watch the commercials. And if you watch the commercials this year, more than likely you saw two commercials that were paid for an, a campaign, Jesus Gets Us. Anybody see the commercials, Jesus Gets Us campaign? You may have seen these different times and at different places on billboards or on TV commercials, things like that. But this is a campaign that's out there. Jesus gets us. And here's a few of the pictures of what you may have seen in this Jesus gets us ad. And I wanted to show the second commercial this morning that they showed. But I, we have copyright laws with our online and the online audience would not have been able to see it. So I, I encourage you, if you did not see that commercial, go online, pull it up. You can see it. And it was <clears throat> so beautifully done. And I thought, man, this went perfect with Pastor Nick's sermon. So beautifully it showed people screaming at each other. And then the line said, Jesus loved the people we hate. Jesus gets us. Yeah. And of course, then on Monday morning, what happened? The attacks on Jesus gets us started in. The divisiveness started in, you know, the world is so divided right now. How do we love in the midst of all of this? Well, I think we have a choice every single day to either build up or tear down. We can build barriers or we can build bridges. How do we do that? Well, we turn to the scriptures. First of all, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. I'm going to be reading from my little Bible that's NRSV. It's kind of the older tradition of scripture or the older translation. And this is the Sermon on the Mount. And he is gathered the crowd and it says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, I want to make sure we got it. His disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now then, I want you to read this one with me. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let that soak in for a minute. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecute the prophets who were before you. Jesus describes this upside-down kingdom in which we experience the blessing in what I call the great reversal. Building bridges is what the seventh beatitude is all about. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called what? Children of God. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And shalom has two meanings. It describes perfect welfare, security, prosperity, happiness. That's why some translations will say, happy are those, right? Happy are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. When one Jew passed another Jew with a greeting of shalom, it, only, it not only wished a man freedom from trouble, but it also wished him everything that made for his contentment and good. Shalom also describes, though, what we call right relationships, intimacy, fellowship, uninterrupted goodwill between people. So when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, he included all of us, not just the president or a diplomat or a community leader, all of us. For peace means more than just stopping the things that make war or conflict. It means working for the welfare and the well-being of all people so that they can be their best and highest. It means good and right relationships. Blessed are the peacemakers, the shalom givers, for they will be called children of God. Now, I think we get the closest to the meaning in these words Jesus says when we take in that peace, that shalom, and that meaning of right relationship. Commenting on this beatitude, uh, one of my favorite theologians and pastors to read, William Barclay, points this out. He says, there are people who are always storm centers of trouble and bitterness and strife. Wherever they are, they are either in quarrels themselves or the cause of quarrels between others. They are troublemakers. Pastor Nick, Nick talked about this last week when he talked about those troublemakers, when he said people say, oh, here comes trouble. There are people like that in almost every society. On the other hand, there are people in whose presence bitterness cannot live. People who bridge the gulfs and heal the breaches and sweeten the bitterness. Such people are doing a godlike work for it is the great purpose of God to bring peace, his shalom. Barclay says the one who divides people is doing the work of evil. The one who unites people is doing God's work. To build a bridge or to build a barrier, it's our choice. I think it helps to have that mindset of shalom. Uh, Some of you who are new here might not remember Pastor Ed. Pastor Ed Whipple, he was here for a short period of time. He was a friend of mine for a very long time. And one of the things that um, he would teach, and it stuck with me over the years, has helped me develop this spirit of shalom, was he would say, the problem is really not the problem. Or the problem is rarely the problem. Or the problem is never the problem. I've heard him say it different ways in different moments. But let's just kind of go with the problem is not really the problem. What I mean here is the thing the person says is the problem is often not the thing that's really bothering them. The problem 
is really not the problem. When someone is reacting or attacking even, the best question you can ask yourself is, what is really going on here? As a pastor, you can imagine I have had several conversations over the years with people who didn't agree with something, a decision the church made or I made or a staff member made. And the first question I always ask myself is this, what is really going on? Because in my experience, this is true, the problem is really not the problem. I remember years ago in a previous appointment when I was doing children's ministry, long time ago, seems like another lifetime, um, there was a mom who approached me in the hallway very upset and angry because her child did not have a Sunday school teacher that morning. There had been no one to volunteer for her Sunday school class. And, and she had gotten her child ready for Sunday school class and, and taken them ready to be able to come in to worship, and there was no one there to teach her class. And me being the children's director, I received that criticism. And I can remember as she was yelling at me in the hallway just thinking, she looks so tired. I could see the fatigue in her eyes, and her husband was rubbing her back as she was crying. And I can remember thinking, the problem's really not the problem. She's exhausted. She's tired, and this is just one more place that there was no one there to help her. When you can ask this question, It will help you keep a spirit of shalom, a spirit of right relationship. What's really going on here? Other times asking myself this question has helped me identify some things. Fears, jealousy, resentment, pain, brokenness. When you ask yourself that question, what's really going on here? Then it can help you stay in that right relationship, that spirit of shalom. And keeping a spirit of shalom is key when loving becomes difficult. Amen, church? It is so important to keep that spirit of shalom. When you can identify the problem, you can choose a path to build a bridge, what I call a pep talk. A pep talk. Now, before I tell you what pep stands for, P-E-P, what I... Before I tell you this, I'm going to tell you that I struggle with this right along with everybody else. This is one of my growing edges. This is one of the ways in which I need to grow in God's grace, okay? So what I mean by pep talk is pause, encourage, pardon. P-E-P, pause, encourage, pardon. The first thing we need to do when we find it is difficult to love someone is take a break. Take a pause. Take a breath. Step out of the situation. Before we let our anger get the best of us or we say something we need not say, it's important to take that pause. It's important to take some time to reflect on the questions that we just talked about. Or, you know, we let that just kind of take over. Because let's face it, we've all had the experience of being so mad that we seethe, right? We've all, that's a human condition that's part of every one of us out here. I dare say not one of us in this room has ever had the experience of never having that happen before. We've had those moments in which we've been so mad. So pausing is not ignoring the problem. I want to be real clear about that. It's not ignoring the problem. It's just taking the space to address the problem with that right spirit of shalom. In my opinion, there's nothing more destructive to our souls than letting anger eat away at us. Because when we let anger fester, it becomes bitterness. And then when we let bitterness into our soul, then then destructive behaviors kind of follow behind. It is a spiritual cancer. It can ruin your life and can make you even physically sick. I've seen this in my own family. One of our own family members was at odds with a co-worker and it was making them physically ill to go to work. And when the conflict was resolved, the illness went away. So 
What do we do in that pause, though? Well, first of all, we pray. We ask God to guide us, to help us see things from their point of view. We stand a moment in their shoes. All of us have our own perception of reality. When we are in conflict with another person, it may not be that we're, they are trying to be difficult to get along with. They just may not see things the way we see them. And so we have to stand for a moment in their shoes. We might talk with a loved one or a friend to get some perspective, a close friend, a confidant, one that you know will not break that confidentiality. This is not gossip. This is just a time to kind of reflect and have a com- holy conversation with someone because they might help you see the other perspective. And then we find some quiet time and some quiet space to think. As Pastor Nick said last week, sometimes you will need to withdraw from the situation. And that might be the best thing you can do when things are unsafe, as he said. When things are destructive or abusive, Jesus taught us to pull away, to remove ourselves. So then the the next thing in our pep talk is to encourage. Encourage. In You Are Not the Target, author Laura Huxley puts it well when she says this, at one time or another, the most fortunate among us make three startling discoveries. First, each one of us has, in varying degree, the power to make others feel better or worse. Secondly, making others feel better is much more fun than making them feel worse. And then thirdly, making others feel better generally makes what? Us feel better. Don't we all need encouragement? Don't you need encouragement from time to time? I know I do. I think it all begins with listening. Stephen Covey says it this way. He says, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And I love that. That's putting the other person first. Can you think of a time in your life in which encouragement changed things? When encouragement deepened a difficult relationship or brought unity from discord? I can think of a few instances in my own life where encouragement changed everything because encouragement is powerful. And then finally, we can choose to pardon. Now, forgiveness is what we're all called to do as Christians. I don't think anyone here would dispute that that's what our call is as Christians, right? We are to forgive. The song so beautifully said that we are set free from his forgiveness. But man, forgiveness is complicated, isn't it, church? Anybody else besides me have trouble with it? It's complicated. It's difficult. Instead of pardoning, how many times do we choose to build a barrier or choose to punish even by giving a cold shoulder or a sarcastic remark? How many times do we instead focus on what was done to us instead of rather looking at ourselves for a good long look and seeing our own flaws in the process, taking an ego check, Choosing to pardon those who are difficult to love does more for us than it does for anyone else because it sets us free. It sets us free. That second song you sang, Tracy, the one that you said had you crying in your pajamas in your, in your bedroom, that song says it all, that w- there's no condemnation in Christ, there's, that we're set free by his forgiveness. And we are to forgive in that same way. It's a tall order. But it's our call. It sets us free. Now, I can remember a long time ago giving a sermon similar to this about forgiveness and how we're called to forgive and and how it sets us free. And I had a a woman who came into my office long ago and and she sat down with me and she said, you know, Pastor Terry, you, you talked about forgiveness last week in your sermon I said yeah I did and she said I'm having trouble with that she said how do I forgive my ex-husband who was so abusive to me 
She sat and talked with me a long time about the things that happened to her, and she was very much abused. She said, how do I forgive that? And I said, well, you know, forgiveness does not change the consequences of his action. Consequences still remain. He still does not get to be your husband. But who's the forgiveness for? We sat and talked a long time about that, how the forgive, that forgiving him would set her free. But it didn't change the consequences. Forgiveness sets us free. Free. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called what church? Children of God. Children of God. In other words, blessed or happy are those who strive for right relationships with one another, for they are doing a God like work. Blessed are those who remember the problem is not really the problem. Blessed are are those who can find encouragement and pardon in the midst of the conflict all around them. Blessed are those who can live in a spirit of shalom. Blessed are the bridge builders. As Christians, we're peculiar people, aren't we? We live by a different set of rules, this upside-down kingdom turn the other cheek, loving our enemies. And that's the point of the Sermon on the Mount and these Beatitudes in particular. They are summons to live in the presence of God and in God's promised future because that future has arrived, church, in Jesus Christ. We're already not yet. We're already in the presence of Christ. We're already living in the forgiveness in the kingdom of God, but yet it is not fully realized when there is still evil in this world. It may seem upside down to love difficult people, but we are called to believe with great daring that in fact it is the right way up. Jesus was the ultimate bridge builder. He knocked down every barrier for us, church. He was the ultimate Bridge builder. And in fact, the New Testament tells us that he spent his life building bridges. The good news is that Jesus shows us how to break down those barriers that make it difficult to love our neighbors as, of, as ourselves. And it's the good news as followers of Christ that we are marked as bridge builders, children of God. And the good news, church, is that Jesus truly gets us. Let's pray. Invite the band back up. Gracious and holy God, life is difficult. So many times we don't get it right. But that's where your forgiveness comes and where your freedom comes. Help us, God, to be your bridge builders. Help us to knock down the barriers between us and our neighbors. Help us to love as you love. Help us to forgive as you forgive. And help us to live as your followers. Followers that live in a light and a love that claims us as your children. May we be your peacemakers. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.